Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Carmen, for the introduction, and thank you for coming by the Wonder House. So um, as some of these images sort of hit home, right, is that over the last year or two, we've experienced a series of very extreme weather and climate events right here in our own backyard in the American West, including record-breaking wildfire season in California, which is where I grew up, uh, flooding in the center of the country uh, in Tennessee, and of course, the heat wave in Portland um, that, you know, that's a place where most of the time people don't need air conditioning, and, and yet we saw temperatures over 100 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And so, um, I think what all this really hits home is that climate change is here, right? So this is no longer something that we're speaking of as something that's coming down the line in the future. It's here right now in our backyard and affecting all of us in very different ways. Whether that be sea level rise if you live in coastal cities or droughts if you live like I do in Tucson. So what What's behind this? Of course, we experience climate change as individuals, often through these extreme events, which are happening in our own backyard and affect our own houses. What's behind this is a relatively innocuous looking curve, which is the rise in global temperatures that we've seen since the late 1800s, which is on the order of about two degrees Fahrenheit or just a little bit over a degree Celsius. And in fact, climate scientists have determined that the, the wedge of warming that has occurred since 1960 is completely attributable to us. It's astounding that humans are responsible for this warming, this persistent warming. It wouldn't have happened without humans putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So the latest report that the IPCC released last summer is using some very strong language now. It's indisputable that humans are causing climate change, indisputable. It's not even something that we really have to talk about much more because it's right here, right? Um, okay, but so where are we headed, right? Obviously, where we're headed in the future really depends on our emissions trajectories, how much greenhouse gases we're going to put out. But what will happen to the climate as CO2 and other greenhouse gases get higher? Well, to understand that, we actually have to look a little bit beyond the instrumental record of climate change that we have from the last few decades. Because honestly, trying to understand climate change by just observing the climate that we have, you know, temperature and humidity and everything that from the last few decades is like trying to understand the rules of a game by watching just a few plays. So if you were new to American football and you watched a couple plays, you'd be like, okay, I have no idea what's going on in this game. You watch a few more plays and you think, Okay, now I'm starting to understand the rules of the game, but if you really want to become a football aficionado, you need to see the full range of the game and all of the plays and all the ref calls and so on. In order to do that, we have to look outside of the instrumental record because the instrumental record isn't a warm climate. It's not a climate where CO2 is high. And that means that we have to go deeper into the past back into geological time and study the ancient record of climate the, the past ancient climates or the paleoclimates. So paleoclimate is a fancy word for the study of ancient climates. I am a paleoclimatologist, this is what I do. Um, and th it's a, the, the whole motivation here is to get some context for how does the Earth system behave when CO2 is high, right? When CO2 is at 400 ppm or even higher because that's where we're headed. So how do we do this? How do we recon reconstruct climate uh, back in time? We don't have um, the ability to time travel and, and take a thermometer with us and find out. We have to rely on the natural archives that record past changes in climate. So what do I mean by these natural archives? You may be familiar with some of them, right? Like, like tree rings, for example. They put on a ring every year and the width of the ring depends on the temperature of the climate and also in the Southwest, how wet or dry it is with dry years having narrower rings and wetter years, wider rings. But we've got some other amazing natural archives of past climate change as well. We have ice cores, which put on a layer of ice every year, so also have those annual bands. We have the corals, which are kind of like the tree rings of the sea. Uh, so we have the corals, which are the tree rings of the sea. They, they put on an, an annual band every year as well and can tell us about how the ocean has changed back in time. 
We also have sediments. We have sediments that are collected from the deep sea. We have sediments that stick out as rock outcrops, like this picture of the Green River Formation, a lake that's 50 million years old and, and sits now in present day Wyoming. All of these archives have information about past changes in temperature and rainfall and other aspects of the Earth system. So let me give you an example. Let's take the ice cores. So ice cores are really special because they actually trap bubbles of ancient air. So you can see the scientist is holding this piece of ice here and there's all these air bubbles. Those bubbles will trap when the snow compressed into ice. And those bubbles are actual archives of ancient air. So all scientists need to do is get in there, extract that air and measure what's in it. And we can directly measure ancient concentrations of CO2 and methane. It's pretty amazing. And so what the ice cores allow us to do is to extend our very short instrumental record of CO2, which expands only back to the 1960s. We've been monitoring CO2 at the summit of Mauna Loa Observatory. And in the graph on the back wall, you can see that there's been a pretty sharp uptick in atmospheric CO2 since the 1960s from about 300 to 400 parts per million. So that's what we have measured. That's it. That's our instrumental record, right? So in order to go back further, we have to tap into the ice cores. The ice cores can take us back even further now into 1700, 1750, the pre-industrial time. And looking at that graph behind you, you can see that we finally hit kind of a baseline condition where CO2 is around 280 parts per million before the Industrial Revolution. So there you go, the ice cores have already expanded our record of CO2 back by several centuries. But because ice cores on Antarctica in particular accumulate very slowly, we can actually take that record back even farther to a whopping 800,000 years ago, almost a million years of CO2 history from the ice cores, which really throws what's happened in the last half century into relief. So we, what you can see in this graph of ice core CO2 is the up and down and the up and down. These correspond to the Earth's ice ages. And they're about oscillations between 180 and 280, sorry, 180 and 280 parts per million. And then at the end, we have this sharp uptick to our present day level of 415. So now, with the help of paleoclimate, we've really thrown into relief what humans have done and how unusual it is. The current level of CO2 has never been seen in 800,000 years due to natural processes. So we're really outside the realm of natural climate variability here. So question, when was the last time that CO2 was at 400 parts per million? Obviously, we're going to have to go back before 800,000 years ago. Does anybody know? Any guesses? The Big Bang. <laughs> well, I like that guess, but we don't have to go back quite that far. But <laughs> yeah, well, let's see if we can answer that question. Um, so we don't have ice cores older than 800,000 years. So we're going to have to tap into another natural archive of climate change instead. We're going to shift to the marine sediments. All right, so marine sediments, they're collected from the bottom of the ocean by specially equipped vessels like this. This is the Joides Resolution, the flagship vessel for the International Ocean Drilling Program, which per its name is an international collaboration between different countries to collect these deep sea sediments. As you'll see, there's something on it that looks like an oil rig, right? But instead of drilling for oil, it's drilling for mud. In the middle of that rig is a large tube that gets dropped down to the bottom of the ocean and then gently lowered into the seafloor mud. And much like you would take your finger over your straw to pull up the water into your straw and pull it up, same thing, cap it off, we bring it up, and then on deck we have a lovely tube of mud. So now we have a tube of mud. How in the world can we use this mud, which doesn't look particularly exciting, to reconstruct past climate? Well, to a paleoclimatologist, when we see that tube of mud, we see gold for all the things that are inside the mud, some of which we can barely see. Some examples of those things would be tiny fossils, little shells of past plankton or zooplankton that lived in the ocean, 
or pollen. If your core is near land, it might have pollen from ancient forests, allowing you to reconstruct the type of ecosystems that existed millions of years ago. There's also things you can't see. The chemistry of the sediments itself, both inorganic and organic chemistry, can tell you about the temperature of the water and the salinity in the past. I want to talk a little bit about these guys, the foraminifera, which have these really cool looking shells. Now this is zoomed in, obviously, it's under a microscope. These things are about the size of a pinhead, so they're really quite small. You can see them, but just barely. So those are calcium carbonate shell. Uh, when these things are alive, they look way cooler, though, and you can see a picture of them alive on the back wall. So you see the shell in the middle. They're a single-celled organism, basically an amoeba. But when they're alive, they have those beautiful spines that reach out. It's actually a predator, this thing. So it's a single-celled predator. It eats tiny shrimp, essentially. So those spines are for hunting, and the sparkles that you see in that picture are symbiotic algae that live together with the foraminifera. They're kind of like living Christmas ornaments. Now, they're also really important for paleoclimate because it turns out the chemistry of their shells unlocks a ton of secrets about past climate, telling us about how hot or cold the ocean was, how salty it was, and believe it or not, even the CO2 levels in the ancient atmosphere. So using these little shells, we can now go back even further in time than the ice cores and get back to our question, when was the last time that CO2 was 415 parts per million. It turns out it was 2 million years ago. And so what I'm showing you here is we have the CO2 from the ice core again in that sort of blue-green color. And you can see it's now compressed in the time scale because we've really zoomed out on the x-axis now. And then the little orange dots are the measurements from the foraminifera. They overlap with the ice core record to make sure we can reproduce the similar changes. And then we can take it back in time into a deeper geological time and find that the last time that we were really consistently hitting that dotted line, which is 415 parts per million, is at least 2 million years ago and probably closer to 3, during a time that geologists call the Pliocene. So not quite the Big Bang, only 3 million years, which is, for a geologist, actually not so long ago, but for a human, it's quite long ago, right? So let's talk about this time, the Pliocene. So this is a warm climate, obviously. The CO2 is similar to today's. What did it look like? Well, the Pliocene was, as you might imagine, quite warm. It was about 3 degrees Celsius, 5 Fahrenheit warmer. And um, that's global average, though. So what you can see in this map, this is actually a climate model simulation run by a colleague of mine. We can use the same models that we use to predict future climate and run them back in time and ask them to predict ancient climates. So that gives us kind of a spatial view of what the Pliocene temperature change looked like. So this is a temperature difference relative to pre-industrial, so before humans started heating the planet. And what you can see everywhere is warmer, but the higher latitudes, the polar regions, are especially warm, right? So we really see that deep red cover of over 10 degrees Fahrenheit warming in the Arctic and the Antarctic. If you look carefully, you can also see that the Greenland ice sheet was way tinier, mostly melted back, entirely melted back. And the West Antarctic ice sheet is also melted back. It's a little hard to see, but it's gone. And together, this melting of the ice sheets contributed 22, uh, about 20 meters of sea level rise. So that's 66 feet. So that's a lot. So sea levels were 66 feet higher 3 million years ago when CO2 was 400 parts per million, which is what it is today. So you might be wondering, like, okay, so how come our ice sheets haven't melted, right? Well, the answer is that ice sheets take a long time to melt, right? They have a lot of inertia. So it takes 1,000 years about for an ice sheet to melt. If we keep CO2s at 400, we'll lose it. We'll lose Greenland eventually, but not really on a human time scale, if that makes sense. There's also some really crazy changes in the patterns of precipitation of rainfall in the Pliocene. So I want to talk about some of those, which, which actually I'm going to focus on the southwest for that. So in the southwest, we have this curious situation where we actually find geological evidence of lakes hanging out in places that today 
are deserts that definitely do not have enough water to be a lake. So this is an example from Western Arizona. This is the Bowes Formation, which is a lake that's about 5 million years old and was connected to the Proto-Colorado River. But there are lake sediments like this all over the place in Arizona and also in Southern California. Behind you is a picture of annual flood deposits from the Pliocene in the Anza Borrego State Park in Southern California. Believe it or not, those layers are annual and they represent these very intense and rhythmic flood deposits that occurred during the Pliocene in apparently a much wetter climate. And so this is a real head scratcher for climatologists because we know that the, that the Southwest is trapped now in a mega drought. It's been in a mega drought. Basically, that's just a word for a long drought for 20 years. So what gives with this evidence for wet conditions? Well, one thing we do know about future climates is they have a tendency to be more intense. Everything gets kind of flashy, right? So thinking back to the intro of my talk, we talked about how all these extreme events are happening in our own backyard. We know that in the future, with every degree of global warming, the extreme events, extreme floods and droughts become more frequent and more intense. So it's just sort of a visualization of that. Both the intensity of the event, which is the bar, and the chance of an extreme event, which are the dots, gets higher in a warmer climate. And so taking this back to the Pliocene, we think that a lot of these really energetic flood deposits represent an amped up summer monsoon, which is a very flashy form of precipitation that affects Southern Arizona. Picture of it on the back wall over the city of Tucson. We think that this monsoon was actually amped up during the Pliocene by high CO2 and contributing to changing the landscape of the Southwest climate. It may have still been kind of dry, but we might have seen more intense storms. And that could explain some of those flood deposits that we see. So now you can see that there's this sort of connection between what we expect for the future and what we see in the past. One more point about the Pliocene before I move to another time period is that, again, for a geologist, it doesn't seem that long ago. But to just put it in perspective, we hadn't even evolved yet in the Pliocene. So our ancestors were there. Lucy, the Australopithecus, was present on the continent of Africa, but humans only evolved 300,000 years ago. So fundamentally, we're an ice age species. We evolved in a climate that was cold. We're used to dealing with ice, glaciers, ice sheets, and ecosystems that are tied to the ice ages. The Pliocene ecosystem was not ours, and it's already outside of the realm of what humans have experienced. All right, so let's go back further in time. What about climates where CO2 is higher than today, more than 400 parts per million? Let's check out that. So we're going to go back much longer in time now, and we're going to cover the climate history of the last 66 million years, which is the entire chunk of Earth's history since the dinosaurs died 66 million years ago. So we, thanks to our friends of Foraminifera, we actually have a record of global temperature going back this far. And here's the Pliocene, the last time it was 400 parts per million. If we go back many millions of years ago, we find that the world has been even warmer, and there is a sort of peak in global warmth during what we call the Eocene greenhouse world. And you can see that it was about 80 degrees Fahrenheit global temperature. For reference, today our global temperature is around 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's pretty toasty. So let's talk about this time period which geologists call the Eocene, 50 million years ago. It was obviously hot, all right? And the continents were kind of moved around a bit, right? So we're in deep enough geological time now that we deal with the tectonic, the slow tectonic changes of the continents. Although you can see things are mostly similar to today, although India hasn't quite slammed into Asia. And what was the climate like? We're talking about 28 degrees Fahrenheit warmer um, and CO2 levels of 1,000 parts per million. Okay, So that's very, very high. That's equivalent to the levels that are expected under the extremely high emission scenarios in the IPCC. So this is like the extreme warm climate. That's why we call it a greenhouse climate or a hothouse climate. All right, so what kind of evidence do we have that it was so warm? A lot, but some of my favorite evidence is actually really simple. The fact that we find crocodile fossils all throughout in the Arctic region. Okay. So obviously crocodiles don't live in the Arctic today. Why? 
they are cold blooded. Okay, so they need warm temperatures to to hang out to do well. The preferred temperature range is between 70 and 100 degrees Fahrenheit or so. If it gets much chillier than that, they're not particularly happy. So this is one way we know that the Arctic was pretty balmy during this 50 million years ago, the Eocene time. If we flip down to the Antarctic coastline, we find evidence that palm trees grew on the coast. These beautiful fossils of palm fronds that are collected from the coastal Antarctic region, which of course today is not very hospitable to palm trees. Palm trees, again, are very frost sensitive, so they wouldn't do well in a place that drops below freezing in the winter. So that gives you an idea that especially the high latitudes were much warmer during the Eocene by a whole lot. So going back to um, some climate model simulations, just to give us a spatial view of what the ESC might have looked like, on the left is, a, is sort of a simulation of the warming that occurred during this Eocene past, relative again to a pre-industrial time. And just for comparison, this is a warming under a high emissions future where we would get four degrees Celsius by 2100. What you can see is that the magnitude of warming is a little different. Obviously, the Eocene is quite extreme in the magnitude, but the patterns are quite similar. In both cases, we see a lot of warming in the Arctic region. And remember that we saw that with the Pliocene as well. We call that phenomenon polar amplification, which is this idea that temperatures increase more at the poles than they do in the equator or in the mid-latitudes. And this seems to be a very persistent feature of the future projections of climate change, and it's also very consistently seen in the past, hence the crocodiles, the palm trees, right? They're sort of benefiting from the polar amplification. So you can see the patterns of change, more warming on the continents and in the ocean, more warming in the high latitudes is actually fairly similar, even though now we are 50 million years in the past. And what about the patterns of rainfall? Let's take a look at that. So again, we have a model simulation of precipitation during the Eocene past relative to the pre-industrial and precipitation under a future where we see 4C warming by 2100, right? And again, the continents have moved in the past, so the exact you know, location of the rain belts are a little different. But overall, if you just look latitudinally, in both cases, the precipitation increases in the tropical places and in the high latitudes, and it decreases in the subtropical regions just off the equator. And that pattern holds regardless of whether we are in the deep past or in the future. It's something fundamental about the climate system that this pattern of rainfall emerges in response to high CO2. We call this the wet get wetter, dry get drier response. It's kind of basic, right? The wet regions like the tropics get wetter, the dry regions like the southwest get drier under this framework. So a lot of similarities between this ancient greenhouse climate and the future, even though in other ways, like the continents, they're different. All right, I want to zoom in on the Eocene climate even closer and take a look at some of these amazing abrupt climate changes that occurred during this greenhouse world. So it turns out that right before we reach the peak warmth in the Eocene time, we see these little sawtooth events here. These are abrupt global warming events that sort of happened evenly spaced. We call them hyperthermals, natural name, because they're extremely warm, even warmer than the baseline. So all of a sudden, Earth's temperature went up, and then it came back down, and then it went up, and then it did it again. And so we call them aberrations, right? Climate aberrations, something that's sort of bumping up the system um, up against back the sort of baseline climate. The first one, which is the largest one, has a special name. It's called the PETM for short which is uh, an acronym for the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum. Not a very pretty name. So we'll just say PETM. So what happened during this event? So first of all, we have evidence that CO2 suddenly blipped up during this event 55.8 million years ago from an already really high background condition of 1,000 parts per million to about double that. So we're really getting into some extreme climates now. At the same time, we see evidence that Earth's temperature followed that and bumped up by about 10 degrees Fahrenheit or so at the same time. So more CO2, higher global temperatures. And in addition, we see that the concentration of chalk buried in the ocean dropped precipitously down to basically zero. So what do I mean by ocean chalk? So that's 
Back to our friends, the Foraminifera, their shells are so numerous in places in the marine sediments that they accumulate and make up over 90% of the sediments that you collect in the deep sea. Here's an example of a core taken from a ship that is basically full of those shells, right, all compressed together. This is the ocean chalk. And it's actually a really important feature of the Earth system because chalk is exceptionally good at keeping the ocean pH level. So when we see a decline in ocean chalk, this is a symptom of ocean acidification, that acid entered the ocean and dissolved the chalk reserve. So let's look at that a little more closely. This is an actual sediment core that covers the PETM event. And what's amazing is that if you follow from left to right, you can see the progression of the event in the colors of the mud. Before the event, way on the left, you can see that the sediments have a ton of that calcium carbonate, that ocean chalk. And then, boom, right here, we see the start of the event, a very sharp boundary and transition to a reddish brown color of the sediment as that ocean chalk is dissolved away. And the only thing left is this sort of reddish brown clay. Moving forward in time this way, even 10,000 years later, we still only see that red clay. And it actually takes 100,000 years for the system to fully recover and for the chalk to come back. So what is acidifying the chalk? It's CO2. So CO2 is an acidic gas. When you take CO2 and add it to water, it makes carbon, carbonic acid, which is a weak acid. It's the reason that the pH of rain is actually 5.7 rather than 7, which is the neutral value. The rain is slightly acidic, yeah? And it's because of CO2. Now, if you put a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, a lot of it's going to get dissolved into the ocean. And when it dissolves into the ocean, the pH of the ocean drops. And it starts to affect things that are chalky in the ocean, including the deep sea chalk, but also organisms that are living in the top of the ocean. For example, our coral reefs today, forams, pteropods, other things that make chalky shells. So this is ocean acidification in action in response to a very fast release of CO2 that was obviously not caused by humans, but caused by geological processes, volcanism, we think. But still, this is a textbook, in this core, this is a textbook reaction of the Earth system to a sudden increase in CO2. And we can learn here, what is the time scale for the ocean to recover from it? It's about 100,000 years, which is kind of long, again, for the human perspective although short for the geological one. So the system recovers, but it takes a long time. So putting this in perspective, let's compare this change in pH, in ocean pH that we see during the PETM to our future projections of ocean pH. So here we've got the historical change in ocean pH on the left in the white line. It's been about a decline of 0.3 pH units since pre-industrial times. In the future, this is our future trajectory, right? depends on how much we emit. The more CO2 we emit, the more pH of the ocean drops and we experience ocean acidification. So what you can see, what's really interesting to me is under the high emission scenarios, we actually achieve an ocean pH that exceeds the drop that was seen during the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum, which is astounding by 2100. So that's quite scary. Conversely, the lower trajectories, actually, you can see that the ocean pH stabilizes and we avoid that super extreme acidification. So you can see the choices really fan out at about 2050. These, these trajectories are very different. And now this is a human time scale, right? This is, this is the predictions by 2100, which some of you will live to see. Now, even though the PETM is, for us geologists, a super fast climate change event, it's worth pointing out that it is nowhere near as fast as what humans have done to the climate system. So the, during the PETM, there was a release of CO2 of about two gigatons of carbon per year. Compare that to the current release rate from humans, which is 10 gigatons of carbon per year. So humans are releasing carbon five times as fast as what happened due to natural causes in the PETM, which means that human-caused climate change is the fastest climate change we know about in the last 66 million years, which is pretty incredible. It's pretty astounding. What would the human climate perturbation look like to a geologist who lived a million years in the future? 
Let's, let's do that experiment and see. We can do that by actually simulating how long, the full tale of how long it would take the Earth system to recover from the human CO2 that we're putting into the atmosphere. So what we're looking at here to the left is the past, and we can see the ice core CO2 and where Homo sapiens evolve. And then to my left on the right are the three scenarios, low, medium, high emissions. So we see that, that really big spike, which is happening right now, just since the Industrial Revolution. And then we see that, low, that slow tail as it comes down, and it takes hundreds of thousands of years, as we learned from the PETM, to fully get back down to something that was close to where we were before, but we actually don't even get back down there. It sort of stabilizes at somewhat of a higher value. And just for reference, these are the values of CO2 in the Pliocene, that medium warm climate we talked about, and then in the Eocene, that hothouse or greenhouse climate. So just an interesting perspective on you know, what, what it would look like to a geologist if they could reconstruct what happened you know, living a million years in the future. Okay, so this is all very scary. And I don't wanna leave you with a taste of total gloom and doom. What the Earth record you know, tells us, right, is that this is some serious stuff, right, climate change. Like, the magnitude that we're affecting the Earth system is unprecedented in recent geological time. It's, it's for real an issue. Um, it's definitely caused by us, right? It's definitely humans, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And it's definitely bad because we don't want to acidify our oceans and we don't want to shift our ecosystems beyond a level to what they're they're used to. But the good news is, unlike the PETM, we are in control of how much CO2 is emitted in the next few decades. So there's a whole lot of hope still because we're in control. And put simply, where we end up depends directly on how much we emit, right? It is a choice. It's a difficult choice and it requires a lot of work and a lot of decisions, but we're still in control of the situation and it's definitely not too late. So let's think about it. The IPCC likes to use these sort of global warming thresholds and you might've seen them in the news. One and a half degrees, two degrees, three degrees, these are in units of Celsius. You might've heard a lot about one and a half degrees and there's been, um, you know, some misinformation that if we miss that goal, that we're doomed. But that's not true. That's not how it works. Basically, there is a one-to-one -one relationship between emissions and temperature, one-to-one. -one. So if we miss our exit to one and a half degrees, right, we're not gonna die, it's okay. You know, what would you do if you missed your exit on a highway, right? You take your foot off the gas and take the next exit. You would not, suddenly serve your car and desperately try to take the exit because that could be dangerous to others. You also would not slam your foot down on the gas, hopefully, right? Um, and miss all of your exits, but you take the next exit, right? So we can always take the next exit. We can always take the next exit. And it really does matter. I showed you those pH graphs for a reason. It makes a difference between severely acidifying the ocean and not. That's still a choice we can make, right? So there is no point of return. There's hope because we can always take the next exit. And the good news is that actually we have already been improving, believe it or not. 10 years ago, we were actually on the worst case scenario. Now, we're not. We're on this middle yellow line where this is our current climate trajectory. It's not the worst because the policies that countries have put in place have already bent the needle, right? So that's great news. You know, if I was giving this talk 10 years ago, I'd have to say uh, that it didn't look so good. But this is looking better. Now, of course, we want to do even better. We'd love to get to blue, right? We want blue. That would be great. But even if we can get slightly closer to blue, we're going to really avoid some of these worst case climate scenarios and we'll experience less extreme events. So what I like to emphasize is just think about less warming. How do we get to less warming? Every incremental change and policy change we can make on the planet can mean less warming. Less warming translates to less extreme events. Just like temperature, the relationship between how extreme floods and droughts are and the, and the change in climate is basically one to one. If you, if you raise global temperature, the extreme events become more extreme. If you stop, they stop, that's it. So they react right there. So we have a lot of control over the system if we choose to.
make those decisions. How about as an individual, right? I think one of the things that's really hard about climate change is like, it's sort of beyond the individual, right? This is talking about decisions that have to be made by countries, um, by cities or counties at least, by states, but usually by countries to make these emission policies. But the individual still does matter, you know? So, you know, what can you do as an individual to sort of engage with climate change? Sometimes the smallest things matter. Talking about it. Unfortunately, in the United States, global, you know, climate change has been politicized. It shouldn't really be. Everyone's going to be affected by global warming, whether they're Republican or Democrat or something else. Global warming does not care <laughs> about your political alignment, right? A lot of people have experienced climate change already in all sorts of sectors of life. Talking about it and meeting people where they are and understanding that is a really powerful thing that moves the needle. Secondly, you know, get involved. There are things that are happening on a town and city level that are really important, like community solar projects or um, efforts to improve public transport, things that make it easier for everyone to use less fossil fuels, right? Those sorts of projects are really great, definitely worth getting involved. And of course, voting. I mean, it's so basic, right? But in these times, it's really hard to feel politically engaged. You know, I feel that, right? But voting is so important because voting in policies and politicians who care is actually how you really get the change done. Because at some level, yes, the government has to make some big decisions, some hard decisions. So you have to stay politically involved, even though sometimes you feel like you don't want to. And so with all these small things, they do add up. They really can bend the needle. We already have. We're already on a medium trajectory and not the worst one, which really leaves me hopeful that we can turn the tide on climate change and move from a condition where it's this impossible, overwhelming thing to it is possible, we can do something, we can take control and avoid the worst climate outcomes. Thank you. <laughs> one thing? Okay. Um, I want people to retain hope. I think climate change is overwhelming, but I remain optimistic. And one of the reasons I remain optimistic is because of science. Because science has already taken us really far in thinking about solutions to climate change. We've already actually bent the needle on global emissions in the last five or 10 years, which is a good sign. And I'm confident that we can do it again. We can do that further um, and that we can actually address the climate crisis.